Chapter One of Peeps at People, being certain papers from the writings of Anne Warrington Witherup. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. Peeps at People, Chapter One, Nansen. It was in the early part of February last that, acting under instructions from headquarters, I set forth from my office in London upon my pilgrimage to the shrines of the world's illustrious. Readers everywhere are interested in the home life of men who have made themselves factors in art, science, letters, and history, and to these people I was commissioned to go. But one restriction was placed upon me in the pursuit of the golden notoriety, and that was that I should spare no expense whatever to attain my ends. At first this was embarrassing. Wealth suddenly acquired always is. But in time I overcame such difficulties as beset me, and soon learned to spend thousands of dollars with comparative ease. And first of all I decided to visit Nansen. To see him at home, if by any possibility Nansen could be at home anywhere, would enable me to open my series interestingly. I remember distinctly that upon his return from the North Pole he had found my own people too cold for comfort. I call to mind that, having traveled for months seeking the Pole, he had accused my fellow countrymen of coming to see him out of mere curiosity, and I recalled, at the same time, that with remarkable originality he had declared that we heated our railway trains to an extent which suggested his future rather than his past. Wherefore, I decided to visit Nansen to hear what else he might have to say, while some of the incidents of his visit were fresh in our minds. The next thing to discover, the decision having been reached, was as to Nansen's whereabouts. Nobody in London seemed to know exactly where he might be found. I asked the manager of the house in which I dwelt, and he hadn't an idea. He never had, for that matter. Then I asked a policeman, and he said he thought he was dancing at the Empire, but he wasn't sure. Next I sought his publishers and asked for his banker's address. The reply included every bank in London, with several trust companies in France and Spain. To my regret, I learned that we Americans hold none of his surplus. "'But where do you send his letters?' I demanded of his publisher, in despair. "'Dr. Nansen has authorized us to destroy them unopened,' was the reply. "'They contain nothing but requests for his autograph.' "'But your letters to him containing his royalties, where do they go?' I demanded. "'We address them to him in our own care,' was the answer. "'And then?' I queried. "'According to his instructions, they are destroyed unopened.' said the publisher, twisting his thumbs meditatively. It seemed hopeless. Suddenly an idea flashed across my mind. I will go, I thought, to the coldest railway station in London, and ask for a ticket for Nansen. A man so fastidious as he is in the matter of temperature, I reasoned, cannot have left London at any one of their moderately warm stations. Where the temperature is most frigid, there Nansen must have gone when leaving. He is such a stickler for temperature." Wherefore, I went to the Waterloo station, it is the coldest railway station I know, and I asked the agent for a ticket for Nansen. He seemed nonplussed for a moment, and, to cover his embarrassment, asked, Second or third class? First, I said, putting down a five-pound note. Certainly, said he, handing me a ticket to Southampton. Do you think you people in the States will really have war with Spain? I will not dilate upon this incident. Suffice it to say that the ticket man sent me to Southampton, where, he said, I'd be most likely to find a boat that would carry me to Nansen. And he was right. I reached Sewiktowich within twenty-four hours, and, holding, as I did, letters of introduction from President McKinley and Her Majesty Queen Victoria, from Richard Croker and Major Pond, Mr. Nansen consented to receive me. He lived in an Eskimo hut on an ice floe, which was passing the winter in the far-famed Maelstrom. How I reached it, heaven only knows. I frankly confess that I do not. I only know that, under the guidance of Svenskild Bjornston, I boarded a plain pine raft such as the Norwegians use, and was paddled out into the seething whirlpool, in the midst of which was Nansen's more or less portable cottage. When I recovered, I found myself seated inside the cottage, which, like everything else in the maelstrom, was waltzing about as if at a military ball or Westchester County dance. Well, said my host, looking at me coldly, you are here. Why are you here? Mr. Nansen, said I. The very same, said he, taking an icicle out of his vest pocket and biting off the end of it. 
the polar explorer i added there is but one nansen said he brushing the rhyme from his eyebrows why ask foolish questions if i am nansen then it goes without saying that i am the polar explorer excuse me i replied i merely wished to know and then i took a one dollar bill from my purse here mr nansen is my dollar that is i understand the regular fee for seeing you i should like now to converse with you what is your price per word have you spoken to my agents he asked no said i then it will only cost you one hundred sixty dollar a word had you arranged through them i should have to charge you two hundred dollar you see he added apologetically i have to pay them a commission of twenty per cent i understand that said i i have given public readings myself and after paying the agent's commissions and traveling expenses i have invariably been compelled to go back and live with my mother for six months miss witherup said nansen rising you did not intend to do it and i therefore forgive you but for the moment you have made me feel warmly toward you please do not do it again frigidity is necessary to my business what can i do for you talk to me said i he immediately froze up again what about said he the pole no said i about america i cannot he cried despairingly i do not wish to dwell upon my sufferings if i told about my american experience people would not believe they would rank me with munchausen my sufferings were so intense let me tell you how i lived on eskimo dog chops and ice cream for nineteen weeks pardon me mr nansen said i but i can't do that we americans know all about the north pole few of us on the other hand know anything about america and we wish to be enlightened what did you think of chicago chicago hm let me see said nansen tapping his forehead gently with an ice pick chicago oh yes i remember it was a charmingly cold city full of trolley cars and having a newly acquired subway and a public library i found it a beautiful city madam and the view from the bunker hill statue of liberty was superb looking down over blackwell's island through the golden gate out into the vast trackless waste of lake superior yes i thought well of it if i remember rightly we took in one thousand eight hundred sixty nine dollar at the door i was surprised at his command of details and resolved further to test his memory and philadelphia mr nansen ah superb city considering its recency as you say in english i met many delightful people there senator tom reed received me at his palace on euclid avenue if i remember the street aright the mayor of the city mr mckinley gave me a dinner at which i sat down with mr cleveland and mr van wyck and mr bryan and mr pulitzer and other members of his cabinet and in my leisure hours i found the theatres of philadelphia most pleasing with mr jefferson singing his nigger songs mr mansfield in his inimitable skirt dancing and best of all mr daly's shakespearean revivals of hamlet and otello with miss rehan in the title roles oh yes miss witherdown wither up i snapped coldly excuse me wither up said the great explorer oh yes miss wither up i found america a most delightful country especially your capital city of philadelphia herr nansen said i are you as accurate in your observations of the north pole as in your notes of the states as expressed to me neither more nor less so said he somewhat uneasily i thought but you have drawn a most delightful picture of the states said i i think all americans will be pleased by your reference to the bunker hill monument at chicago and mayor mckinley's cabinet at philadelphia on the other hand you spoke of intense suffering while with us yes said he i did because i suffered have you ever traveled in your own country madam i'm an american said i therefore when i travel i travel abroad then you do not know the privations of american travel he cried consider me nansen compelled after the delightful discomfort of the fram to have to endure the horrid excellence of your pullman service consider me nansen after having subsisted on dogs in kerosene oil for months having to eat a breakfast costing a dollar at one of your american hotels 
consisting of porridge, broiled chicken, deviled kidney, four kinds of potatoes, eggs in every style, real coffee, and buckwheat cakes. Consider me, Nansen, I inquired. Yes, Nansen, said he. Consider me, Nansen, used to the cold of the Arctic regions, the Arctic perils, having to wake up every morning in an American hotel or an American parlor car, warm, without peril, comfortable, without anything whatsoever to growl about. It must have been devilish, said I. It was, said he. Well, Mr. Nansen, I put in, rising, you can stand it. You are cold enough to stay in Hades for forty-seven years without losing your outside garments. How much do I owe you? Fifteen thousand dollars, please, said he. I gave him the money and swam away. Goodbye, he cried, as I reached the outer edge of the maelstrom. I hope next time I go to America that I shall meet you. Many thanks, said I. When do you expect to come? Never, he replied. Deo volente. Charming chap, that Nansen. So warm, you know. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of Peeps at People Being Certain Papers from the Writings of Anne Warrington Wuthrop. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Taylor Davison. Peeps at People, Chapter Two Mr. Hall Kane. I do not know why it should have happened so. But it did happen that after my interview with Nansen, I felt gloomy in my soul, and hence naturally sought congenial company. My first inclination was to run down to Greece and take luncheon with King George. But when I came to look over my languages, the only bit of Greek I could speak fluently turned out to be hoi poi. From private advances, I gather that that is the only bit of Greek that his honor the king has no use for. Therefore, I bought a ticket straight through to Gloomster Abbey, Isle of Man. The residence of Hall Kane. Appropriately enough, it was midnight when I arrived. It was a moonlit night, but there were a dozen clouds on the horizon, and directly in the wake of the moon's rays, so that all was dark. From the abbey itself no single ray of light gleamed, and all was still save for the croaking of the tree toads in the moat and the cricket of the roof on the parapet. Anyone else would have been chilled to the morrow. But I, having visited Nansen, had to use a fan to overcome the extreme cordiality of the scene. With the thermometer at thirty-two degrees, I nearly swooned with the heat. "'Is this the Gloomster Abbey?' I asked of my hackman. "'Yes,' said he. "'And for humanity's sake, pay your fare and let me go. I am the father of seven orphans and the husband of their widowed mother. If I stay here ten minutes, I'll die, and my wife will marry again.' Heaven help her! I paid him six pounds, ten shillings, and six pence, and let him go. He was nothing to me, but his family had my sympathy. Then I knocked on the portcullis with all my might, and was gratified to find that, like a well-regulated portcullis, it fell, and with a loud noise withal. An intense silence intervened, and then out of the blackness of the blue above me there came a voice with a reddish tinge to it. "'Who's there?' said the voice. If you are a burglar, come in and rob. If you are a friend, wait a minute. If you are an interviewer from an American Sunday newspaper, accept my apologies for keeping you waiting, turn the knob, and walk in. I'll be down as soon as I can get there. It was Hall Kane himself who spoke. I turned the knob and walked in. All was still, dark, and cold, but I did not mind, for it fitted into my mood exactly. In the darkness of the corridor within, I barked, What if I were a man, I should call my shins. As it happened, being a woman, I merely brushed my ankles, when he appeared, Hall Kane himself. There was no gaslight, no electric light, nothing but the blackness of the night. And he appeared! I suppose it was all due to the fact that he is a brilliant man, who would shine anywhere. However it may have been, I suddenly became conscious of a being that walked towards me as plainly discernible as an ocean steamship at sea at night. With every electric light burning in the saloon, 
and the red and green lanterns on the starboard and port sides of its bow. "'Mr. Kane,' I said, addressing his starboard side. "'That's I,' he said, grammatically and with dignity. "'A man less great would have said, "'That's me,' which is why in the darkness I knew it was Mr. Kane and not his hired man I was speaking to, or with, as your style may require. "'Mr. Kane,' said I, not without nervousness. "'I have come, so I perceive,' said he, and then an inspiration came to me. "'To lay my gloom at your feet,' I said, with apparent meekness. "'It is all I have, but such as it is you are welcome to it. "'Some people would have brought you rich gifts and gold and silver. "'Some would have come with compliments and requests for your autograph. "'I bring you only a morbid heart bursting with gloom. "'Will you take it?' "'I appreciate the courtesy, madame,' replied the great man, "'wiping a tear from the end of his nose.' which twinkled like a silver star in the blackness of the corridor. But I cannot accept your offering. I have more gloom on hand than I know what to do with. I am, however, deeply touched, and beg to offer you the hospitality of the moat, unless you have further business with me at my regular rates. A dreadful, blood-curdling wail, like that of a soul in torment, interrupted my answer. It seemed to come from the very centre of the earth directly beneath my feet. I was frozen with horror, and my host, with a muttered imprecation, turned and ran off. "'I haven't time to see you now!' he cried as he disappeared down the steps of a yawning hole at the far end of the corridor. "'I can't afford to miss the experiment for anything so small and cheap as a morbid heart bursting with gloom.' I followed closely after, although he had not granted permission. I didn't feel that I could afford to miss the experiment either— and ere he had time to slam the door of the dungeon, which we ultimately reached, I was inside his workshop. If it was chill without, it was deadly within, save that the darkness was not so intense, red lights burning dimly in each of the four corners of the dungeon. The walls were covered with a green, trickling ooze from the moat, and underfoot the ground was dank and almost mushy. In the very centre of the place was a huge rack, a relic of some bygone age of torture, and stretched at full length upon a man of, should I say, about forty years of age. Two flunkies in livery, red plush trousers and powdered wig, now and then turned the screw, and with each turn horrid shrieks would come from the victim, mingled with alternate prayers and curses. "'What on earth is the meaning of this?' I cried in horror. "'It means, madame,' replied the famous author calmly, "'that I never fake.' All my situations, all my passages, descriptive of human emotions and sufferings, are drawn from life and not from the imagination. You work from living models? I gasped. Why would not a lay figure do as well for torture? Because lay figures do not shriek and pray and curse. I am surprised that you would be so dull. James, turn the thumbscrew three times, and Grimmins, take your cricket bat and give the patient a bastinado on his right foot. "'It is a pitiless shame!' I cried. "'It is in the interest of art, madame,' said the novelist, shrugging his shoulders. "'Just as our surgeons have to vivisect for the advancement of science, "'so must I conduct experiments here in the interest of letters. "'My new novel has a stirring episode in it based upon the capture and torture "'of a newspaper correspondent in Tibet. "'I might, I suppose, have imagined the whole thing.' But this so far surpasses the imagination that I am convinced it is the better way of getting my color. There isn't any doubt about that, said I. But consider this man here, whose limbs you are stretching beyond all endurance. He should regard it as a splendid sacrifice, vouchsafed the novelist, lighting a cigarette and winking pleasantly at his victim. Is he a voluntary sacrifice? I demanded. Rather good joke, that, eh, Rogers? laughed Mr. Kane, addressing the sufferer. This simple-minded little American girl asks if you are here because you like it. Ha! <laughs> what a droll idea. Thinks you do this for pleasure, Rogers. Has an idea you tied yourself on there and racked yourself at first, so she has. Thinks you shriek as to smother your laughter, which would be very inappropriate to the occasion. The sufferer groaned deeply, and the novelist, turning to me, observed, No, madame. My poor, unhappy friend Rogers is here against his will, I regret to say. 
it would be far pleasanter for me when i hear him bastinado to know that he derived a certain amount of personal satisfaction from it in spite of the pain but it must otherwise furthermore in the story the newspaper man who is tortured is not supposed to like it so that accuracy requires i should have a man like rogers who dislikes it intensely and you mean to say sir that you deliberately went out into the street and seized hold of this poor fellow carried him in here and subjected him to all this why it's a crime not at all replied mr kane nonchalantly i am no common kidnapper i do not belong to a literary press gang i have simply exercised my rights as the owner of this castle this man came here on his own responsibility just as you have come i never asked him any more than i asked you and he has had to take the consequences just as you will have to abide by whatever may result from your temerity rogers is a newspaper man he tried to get a free interview out of me by deceit knowing that i no longer do gratis business it so happened that i was at the moment in need of just such a person for my experiment i gave him the interview and now he's paying for it the novelist paused and after eyeing me somewhat closely for a moment turned to his notes lying on his desk alongside the rack while a tremor of fear passed over me curious coincidence he remarked looking up from an abstract of his story in my very next chapter i take up the sufferings in captivity of a young and beautiful american girl who is languishing and starving in a loathsome cell full of reptiles and poisonous beasts like gala monsters and centipedes she is to be just your height and coloring and age i grew rigid with horror you wouldn't i began oh yes i would replied the author pleasantly would you like to see the cell i would like to see the outside of your castle i cried turning to the stairs the novelist laughed hollowly at the expression of hopelessness that came over my face as i observed that the huge iron grating had slid down from above and cut off my retreat i am sorry miss withrop i haven't got the outside of my castle in here if i had i'd show it to you at once he said i beg of you sir i cried going down on my knees before him do let me go i don't be emotional my dear he replied in a nice fatherly way you will have an alternative when i receive this he added writing out a bill and tossing it to me when i have receipted this you can go i glanced for the paper it called for fifteen hundred pounds for an interview of an hour and a half at one thousand pounds an hour if you give me your check for that amount you may go otherwise i am afraid i shall have to use you for a model i only have twelve hundred pounds in the bank i replied bursting into tears it will suffice he said your terror will be worth three hundred pounds to me in a short story i am writing for the manx sunday world whereupon i wrote him a check for twelve hundred pounds and made my escape i'll expose you to the world i roared back at him in my wrath as i walked down the path to the road do he cried i never object to a free advertisement bye-bye with that i left him and hastened back to london to stop payment on the check but in some fashion he got the better of me for it happened to be on a bank holiday that i arrived and ere i could give notice to the cashier to refuse to honor my draft it had been cashed End of chapter two recording by taylor davison chapter three of peeps at people being certain papers from the writings of anne warrington witherup by john kendrick banks this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. K. Edison, New Jersey. Peeps at People. Chapter 3. Emperor William. After recovering from the attack of nervous prostration, which was the natural result of my short visit to Gloomster Abbey, acting on my physician's advice, I left England for a time. Finding myself some weeks later in Berlin, I resolved to call upon His Imperial Highness William the Second, better known as the Yellow Kid of Potsdam. I experienced some difficulty at first in reaching the Emperor. Royalty is so hedged about by etiquette 
that it seemed almost impossible that I should get an audience with him at all. He was the most charming about the matter, but, as he said in his note to me, he could not forget the difference in our respective stations in life. For an emperor to consent to receive a plain American newspaper woman was out of the question. He could be interviewed in Cog, however, as Mr. William Hohenzollern, if that would suit my wishes. I replied instantly that it was not Mr. William Hohenzollern that I wished to interview, but the German emperor, and unless I could see him as emperor, I did not wish to see him at all. I added that I might come in cock myself if all that was necessary to make the whole thing regular was that I should appear to be on a social level with him, and instead of calling as Miss Witherup, I could call as the Marchioness of Spice and Dival, or, if he preferred, Princess of Harlem Heights, to both of which titles I assured him I had as valid a claim as any other lady journalist in the world, in fact, more so, since they were both of my own invention. Whether it was the independence of my action, or the novelty of the situation that brought it about, I do not know. But the return mail brought a command from the Emperor to the Princess of Harlem Heights to attend a royal fete given in her honour at the Potsdam Palace the next morning at twenty minutes after eleven. I was there on the stroke of the hour, and found His Imperial Highness sitting on a small gilt throne, surrounded by mirrors, having his tintype taken. This is one of the Emperor's daily duties, and one which he has never neglected from the day of his birth. He has a complete set of these tintypes ranged about the walls of his private sanctum in the form of a frieze, and he frequently spends hours at a time, seated on a stepladder, examining himself as he looked on certain days in the past. He smiled affably as the Grand High Chamberlain announced, The Princess of Harlem Heights! and on my entrance threw me one of his imperial gloves to shake. Hock, he cried as he did so. Ditto, Hick, I answered with my most charming smile. I hope I do not disturb you, my dear Emperor. Not in the least, he replied. Nothing disturbs us. We are the very centre of equanimity. We are a sort of human Gibraltar which nothing can move. It's a nice day out, he added. Most charming, said I. Indeed, a nicer day out than this no one could wish for. We are glad you find it so, madame. Excuse me, sire, I said firmly. Princess. Indeed, yes, we had forgotten, he replied, with a courteous wave of his hand. It could not be otherwise. We are glad, princess, that you find the day nice out. We ordered it so, and it is pleasant to feel that what we do for the world is appreciated. We shall not ask you why you have sought this interview, he continued. We can quite understand, without wasting our time on frivolous questions, why any one, even a beautiful American like yourself, should wish to see us in person. Are you in Berlin for long? Only until next Thursday, sire, I replied. What a pity, he commented, rising from the throne and stroking his moustache before one of the mirrors. What a tremendous pity. We should have been pleased to have had you with us longer. Emperor, said I, this is no time for vain compliments however pleasing to me they may be. Let us get down to business. Let us talk about the great problems of the day. As you will, Princess, he replied. To begin with, we were born... Pardon me, sire, I interrupted, but I know all about your history. They study us in your schools, do they? Ah, well, they do rightly, said the Emperor, with a wink of satisfaction at himself in the glass. They indeed do rightly to study us. When one considers what we are the result of... Far back, princes, in the days of Thor, the original plans for William II were made. This person, whom we have the distinguished and sacred honour to be, was contemplated in the days when chaos ruled. Gods have dreamed of him. Goddesses have sighed for him. Epochs have shed bitter tears because he was not yet. And finally he is here, in us, incarnate sublimity that we are. The emperor thumped his chest proudly as he spoke, until the gold on his uniform fairly rang. Are we, uh, are we appreciated in America? he asked. To the full, Emperor, to the full, I replied instantly. I do not know any country on the face of this grand green earth where you are quoted more often at your full value than with us. And, uh, he added with a slight coyness of manner, we are, uh, supposed to be at what you Americans call par and a premium, eh? Emperor, said I, you are known to us as yourself. Madame, or rather princess, he cried ecstatically. 
you could not have praised us more highly. He touched an electric button as he spoke, and instantly a button appeared. The Iron Cross, he cried. Not for me, O sire, not for me, said I, almost swooning with joy. No, princess, not for you, said the emperor, for ourselves. We shall give you one of the buttons of her imperial court. It is our habit every morning at this hour to decorate our imperial self, and we have rung for the usual thing, just as we Americans would ring for a Manhattan cocktail. What? I cried, wondering at the man's marvellous acquaintance with the slightest details of American life. You know the Manhattan cocktail? Princess, said the emperor proudly, we know everything. And this was a man they call Willy Boy in London. Emperor, said I, about the partition of China? Well, said he, what of the partition of China? Is it to be partitioned? The emperor's eye twinkled. We have not yet read the morning papers, princess, he said, but we judge from what we saw in the society news of last night's Fligende Coinal that there will be a military ball at Peking shortly, and that the affair will end brilliantly with a, a, a German. Good, said I, and you will really fight England? Why not, said he, with a smile at the looking glass. Your grandmother, I queried with a slight shake of my head, in deprecation of a family row. She calls us Billy, he cried passionately. Grandmothers can do a great many things, princess, but no grandmother that heaven ever sent into this world shall call us Billy with impunity. I was silent for a moment. Still, emperor, I said at last, England has been very good to you. She has furnished you with all the coal your ships needed to steam into Chinese waters. Surely that was the act of a grandmother. You wouldn't fight her after that. We will, if she'll lend us ammunition for our guns, said the emperor gloomily. If she won't do that, then of course there will be no war. But, princess, let us talk of other things. Have you heard a latest musical composition? I frankly confess that I had not, and the imperial band was called up and ordered to play the emperor's new march. It was very moving, and made me somewhat homesick, for, after all, with all due respect to William's originality, it was nothing more than a slightly Prussianized rendering of, quote, all coons look alike to me, end quote. However, I praised the work, and added that I had heard nothing like it in Wagner, which seemed to please the emperor very much. I have since heard that as a composer he resents Wagner, and attributes the success of the latter merely to that accident of birth, which brought the composer into the world a half-century before William had his chance. And now, princes, he observed, as the music ceased, your audience is over. We are to have a portrait painted at midday, and the hour is come. Assure your people of our undying regard. You may kiss our little finger. And will not your majesty honour me with this autograph? I asked, holding out my book, after I had kissed his little finger. With pleasure said he, taking the book and complying with my request as follows. Faithfully, your warlord and master, me. Wasn't it characteristic? End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Peeps at People – Being Certain Papers from the Writings of Anne Warrington Witherup. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. Peeps at People, Mr. Alfred Austin. It was on a beautiful March afternoon that I sought out the Poet Laureate of England in his official sanctum in London. A splendid mantle of fog hung over the street, shutting out the otherwise all too commercial aspect of that honoured byway it was midday to the stroke of the hour and a soft mellow glare suffused the perspective in either direction proceeding from the gas lamps upon the street corners which like the fires of eternal youth are kept constantly burning in the capital city of the guelphs i approached the lair of england's first poet with a beating heart the trip hammer like thudding of which against my ribs could be heard like the pounding of the twin screws of an atlantic liner far down beneath the folds of my mackintosh to stand in the presence of tennyson's successor was an ambition to wish to gratify but it was awesome and not a little difficult for the nervous system however once committed to the enterprise i was not to be baffled and with shaking knees and tremulous hand i banged the brazen knocker against the door 
until the hall within echoed and re-echoed with its clangor immediately a window on the top story was opened and the laureate himself thrust his head out i could dimly perceive the contour of his noble forehead through the mist who's there who's there i fain would know are you some dull and dunning dog are you a friend or eke a foe i cannot see you through the fog said he i am an american lady journalist i cried up to him making a megaphone of my two hands so that he might not miss a word and i have come to offer you seven dollars a word for a glimpse of you at home how much is that in pounds shillings and pence he asked eagerly one pound eight said i i'll be down he replied instantly and drawing his noble brow in out of the wet he slammed the window to and if the squeaking sounds i heard within meant anything slid down the banisters in order not to keep me waiting longer than was necessary he opened the door and in a moment we stood face to face mr alfred austin said i the same o oh lady journalist i'm glad to take you by the fist particularly since i've heard you offer one panate per word said he cordially grasping me by the hand come right up and make yourself perfectly at home and i'll give you an imitation of my daily routine and will answer whatever questions you may see fit to ask of course you must be aware that i am averse to this sort of thing generally the true poet cannot permit the searchlight of publicity to be turned upon his home without losing something of that delicate hold on mr austin said i i don't wish to be rude but i am not authorized to pay you seven dollars apiece for such words as these you are uttering if you have any explanations to offer the public for condescending to let me peep at you while you work you must do it at your own expense a shade of disappointment passed over his delicate features there's a hundred guineas gone at a stroke he muttered and for an instant i feared that i was to receive my conge by a strong effort of the will however the laureate pulled himself together if that's the case o oh yankee fair suppose we hasten up the stair where every day the muses call and waste no words here in the hall said he and then he added courteously i am sorry the elevator isn't running it's one of these english elevators you know indeed said i and what is the peculiarity of an english elevator like britons neat the foeman's serried guns the british elevator never runs for like the brain of the scottish thane the thane you know of cardor our lifts are always out of order he explained it's very annoying too particularly when you have to carry poems up and down stairs you should let your poems do their own walking mr austin said i i beg your pardon said he but how can they those i've seen have had feet enough for a centipede said i as dryly as i could considering that i was still dripping with fog the laureate scratched his head solemnly quite so he said at length but come let us hasten we hastened upward and five minutes later we were in the sanctum it was a charming room a complete set of the british poets stood ranged in chronological sequence on the table a copy of hood's rhymster well thumbed lay open on the sofa and a volume of popular quotations lay on the floor beside the poet's easy chair a full-length portrait of her majesty the queen seven inches high and sixteen wide hung over the fireplace and beneath it stood a charming bust of the late lord tennyson with the face turned towards the wall a beautiful workshop said i surely one sees now the sources of your inspiration tis true my dear tis very very true here in my sanctum high above the pave ma'am i can't help doing all the things i do not e'en my great immortal soul to save ma'am you see a man who daily has to write of things of which calliope doth side talk must get above the earth and leave the white who dully plods along along the sidewalk he answered that's why i live under the roof instead of hiring chambers on the ground floor up here i am not bothered by what in one of my new poems i shall call mundane things rather good expression that don't you think the first draft reads 
mundane things mundane things handsome cabs and finger rings drossy glitter and glittering dross may i never come across merely mundane mundane things rather clever to be tossed off on a scratch pad while taking a shower bath eh yes said i what suggested it the merest accident i got some soap in my eye and was about to give way to my temper when i thought to myself that the true poet ought to rise above petty annoyances of that nature in other words above mundane things wonderfully interesting i put in was your appointment a surprise to you mr austin surprise nay nay my lovely maid pray why should i surprise it be despite that fortune's but a fickle jade i knew the thing must come to me for in these days commercial don't you see from eyes like mine no thing can e'er be hid and when they advertised for poetry twas i put in the very lowest bid he replied you see as a newspaper man i knew what rates the other poets were getting there was swinburne getting seven bob a line and sir edwin arnold asking a guinea a yard and old kipling grinding it out for one and six per quatrain and watson doing sonnets on the yellow north and the red white and blue east and the pink sou'west at five pounds a dozen so when salisbury rang me up on the phone and said i'd better put in a bid for the verse contract i knew just how to arrange my rates to get the work you had a great advantage over the others said i which shows the value of a newspaper training newspaper men know everything he said i had but one fear and that was your american poets they are hustlers and i didn't know but that some enterprising american like russell sage or barnum and bailey would farm a syndicate and corner america's poem supply and bowl my wickets from under me working together they could have done it but they didn't know their power thank heaven if i may borrow an americanism well mr austin said i rising i am afraid i shall have to go i fear your words have already exceeded the appropriation ah uh, how much do i owe you the laureate took from beneath his chin a small golden object that looked like a locket opening it he scanned it closely for a moment my chinometer says nine hundred and sixty-three words let us call it a thousand i don't care for trifles said he very well i replied that is seven thousand dollars i owe you yes he said but of course i allow you the usual discount for what said i cash said he pool does it on clothes and i've adopted the system it pays in the end for as i say in my next ode to the queen to be written on the occasion of her ruby jubilee a sovereign in hand is worth two heirs presumptive in the bush in other words cash deferred maketh the heart sick precisely i'll put that motto down in my notebook for future use i thank you for the compliment said i as i paid him five thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars good-bye mr austin good-bye miss witherup said he any time when you find you have a half hour and a thousand pounds to spare come again say au revoir but not good-bye for why there is no cause to whisper vaguely when we can parley without a fear that words are cheap my dear said he ushering me downstairs and bowing me out into the fog which by this time had lightened so that i could see the end of my nose as i walked along End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of Peeps at People Being Certain Papers from the Writings of Anne Warrington Withrop by John Kendrick Bangs This is a LibriVox recording All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain For more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by diana schmidt peeps at people andrew lang several days after the exhilarating interview with the poet laureate of england i was honored by a dinner given to me by the honorable company of lady copymongers 
at their guild hall in piccadilly circus southwest it was a delightful affair and i met many ladies of prominence in literary fields miss braddon and john oliver hobbs were there and one rather stout old lady of regal manner who was introduced as clara gulf but whom i strongly suspected to be none other than the authoress of that famous and justly popular work leaves from my diary in the highlands or sixty years a potentate she was very gracious to me and promised to send me an autograph copy of her publisher's circular most interesting of all the persons encountered at the banquet however was miss philippa phipps phipps forewoman of the andrew lang manuscript manufacturing company from whom i gained much startling information which i am certain will interest the public in the course of our conversation i observed to miss phipps phipps of whom i had never heard before that nothing in modern letters so amazed me as the output of andrew lang for both its quality and its quantity the lady flushed pleasurably and said modestly we try to keep up to the standard miss withrop as a worker in literary fields you perhaps realize how hard it is to do this but of one thing i assure you we have never in the last ten years allowed a bit of scamp work of any description to go out of our factory of course we have grades of work but the lower grades do not go out with the lang mark upon them i looked at miss phipps phipps in a puzzled way for the full import of her words did not dawn upon me instantly i don't quite understand said i we who are we the lang manuscript manufacturing company explained the young woman you are aware of course that andrew lang is not an individual but a corporation i certainly never dreamed it said i with a half smile how could it be otherwise asked miss phipps phipps no human being could alone turn out an average of six hundred forty seven million words a year miss withrop not even if he could run two typewriters at once and write with his feet while dictating to a stenographer it would be a physical impossibility dear me i cried in amazement i know that there were thousands of articles from lang every year but six hundred forty seven million words why it is incredible that is only the average you know said miss phipps phipps proudly in good years we have run as high as seven hundred sixteen million three hundred forty six words and this year if all goes well and our operatives do not strike we expect to turn out over eight hundred million we have signed contracts to deliver one hundred eleven million three hundred eighty three thousand words in the month of june alone mostly christmas stuff you know to be published next november last month we turned out thirty nine thousand lines of poetry a day for twenty five working days and our essay mill has been running overtime for sixteen weeks well i am surprised said i yet when i come to think of it there is no reason why i should be this is an age of corporations precisely said miss phipps phipps furthermore ours had a philanthropic motive at the bottom of it all here was mr lang simply killing himself with work and some seven hundred young men and women of an aspiring turn of mind absolutely out of employment the burdens of the one we believed could be made to relieve the necessities of the other and we made the proposition to mr lang to make himself over to us promising to fill his contracts and relieve him of the necessity of doing any further literary work for the rest of his life we incorporated him on a basis of two million pounds giving him one million pounds in shares the rest was advertised as for sale and was oversubscribed ten to one workshops were built at woking and as a starter six hundred operatives were employed working night and day at the end of the first year we were just three months behind our orders we immediately doubled our force to twelve hundred and so it has gone until today and the business is constantly increasing our stock is at a premium of one hundred seventeen per cent 
and we keep three thousand seven hundred fifty people with the capacity of ten thousand words a day each constantly employed i am astonished i cried the magnitude of the work is appalling are your shops open to visitors certainly i shall be pleased if you will come out to woking to-morrow and i will show you over the establishment replied miss phipps phipps courteously and then for the moment the conversation stopped the next day i was at woking where miss phipps phipps met me at the station a ten minutes drive brought us to the factory a detailed description of which would be impossible in the limits at my disposal suffice it to say that after an hour's walk through the various departments i was still not half acquainted with the marvels of the establishment in the essay and letters to dead authors department sixty-eight girls were driving their pens at a rate that made my head whirl a whole floor was given over to the fairy tale department and i saw fairy books of all colors in the rainbow being turned out at a rapid rate here said the forelady as we reached a large capacious and well-lighted writing-room is our latest venture there are seven hundred employees in here and they work from nine a m to twelve have a half hour for luncheon and resume at five they go home they have in hand the lang meredith we have purchased from mr meredith all right and title to his complete works which we are having rewritten these will appear at the proper time as the lucid meredith by andrew lang the old gentleman at the desk over there she added pointing to a keen-eyed sharp-visaged fellow with a long nose and nervous manner is mr fergus holmes who began life as a detective and became a critic he is here on a large salary and has nothing to do but use his critical insight and detective instinct to find the thought in some of mr meredith's most complicated periods after all miss withrop our operators are only human and some of them cannot understand meredith as well as they might i am glad to know said i with a laugh that you pay mr fergus holmes a large salary a man employed to detect the thought of some of mr meredith's paragraphs oh we understand all about that miss phipps phipps smiled in return we know his value which is very great in this particular matter and does he never fail i asked i presume he does but he never gives up once he asked to be allowed to consult with mr meredith before giving an opinion and we consented he wrote to the author and it turned out that mr meredith had forgotten the paragraph entirely and couldn't tell himself what he meant but he was very nice about it he gave us carte blanche to make it mean anything that would fit into the rest of the story we passed into another room this room said miss phipps phipps is at present devoted to the british poets there have been a great many bad poets in britain who have become immortal and we are trying to make them good that young man over there with red hair is rewriting burns the introduction we are doing in our essay room that young lady in blue glasses is doing gay over again and we have entrusted our lang edition of herrick to the retired clergyman whom you see sitting on that settee by the window with the slate on his lap to show you how completely we do our work let me tell you that in this case of herrick all his poems were first copied off on slates by our ordinary copyists so that the clergyman who is doing them over again has only to wet his finger to rub out what might strike some people as an immortal line it's a splendid idea i cried but wouldn't a blackboard prove less expensive we never consider expense said miss phipps phipps we really do not have to you see with a capacity of eight hundred million words a year at the rates for lang for which we pay at rates for the unknown we are left with a margin of profit which pleases our stockholders and does not arouse the cupidity of other authors what a wonderful system said i we think it so said miss phipps phipps placidly and do you never have any troubles i asked oh yes replied my hostess only last week 
the grass of parnassus and blue ballad employees rose up and struck for sixpence more per quatrain we locked them out and to-day have filled their places with equally competent employees you can always find plenty of unemployed and unpublished poets ready to step in our prose hands do not give us much trouble and our revisers never say a word have you any novelties in hand i asked oh yes said miss phipps phipps we are going to supersede boswell with lang's johnson we are preparing a lang shakespeare and when the copyrights on thackeray and dickens have expired we'll do them all over again then we are experimenting in colors for a new fairy book and our chromatic bibles will be a great thing we are also contemplating an offer to the french academy to permit all the works of its members to be issued as ours i really think that daudet by andrew lang would pay hugo by lang might prove too much for the british public but we shall do it because we have confidence in ourselves we shall issue the philosophy of schopenhauer by andrew lang next week how about our american authors i queried are you going to rewrite any of them who are they asked miss phipps with an admirable expression of ingenuousness well said i myself and ah uh, edgar poe any poets said miss phipps phipps some i answered myself and a uh, longfellow i don't know said miss phipps phipps becoming somewhat reserved send me your manuscript i have heard of you of course but uh who is miss longfellow i contented myself with a reference to the scenery and then i said miss double phipps i wish you would conduct me into the presence of mr lang i like him as a manly man and i love him for the books he has put forth which not only show his manliness but his appreciation of everything in letters that is good well really miss withrop said miss phipps phipps we don't know where he is but we think it is not my thought but that of the corporation we think you will find him playing golf at st andrews thank you said i but after all i added it is not what the corporation thinks so much as what you as an individual think where do you believe i may find mr lang among the immortals was the answer spoken with enthusiasm and believing that the lady was right i ceased to look for mr lang for in the presence of immortals i always feel myself to be foolish nevertheless i am very glad to have seen the lang company at woking and i now understand many things that i never understood before end of andrew lang chapter six of peeps at people being certain papers from the writings of anne warrington witherup by john kendrick bangs this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eva davis peeps at people zola to visit a series of foreign celebrities at home without including emile zola in the list would be very like refusing to listen to the lines of hamlet in bacon's immortal tragedy of that name furthermore to call upon the justly famous novelist presupposes a visit to paris which is a delightful thing even for a lady journalist hence it was that on leaving woking after my charming little glimpse into the home life of the lang manuscript manufacturing company i decided to take a run across the channel and look up the frenchman of the hour the diversion had about it an air of adventure which made it pleasantly exciting for ten hours after my arrival at paris i did not dare ask where the novelist lived for fear that i might be arrested and sent to devil's island with captain dreyfus or forced to languish for a year or two at the chateau d'if near marseilles until the government could get a chance formally to inquire why i wished to know the abiding place of monsieur zola there was added to this also some apprehension that even if i escaped the gendarmes the people themselves might rise up and string me to a lamp-post as a suitable answer to so treasonable a question 
to tell the truth i did not go about my business with my usual nerve and aplomb had i represented only myself i should not have hesitated to expose myself to any or to all danger entrusted as i was however with the commission of great importance to those whom i serve at home it was my duty to proceed cautiously and save my life i therefore went at the matter diplomatically for fifty centimes i induced a small flower-girl whom i encountered in front of the cafe de la paix to inquire of the head-waiter of that establishment where m zola could be met the tragedy that ensued was terrible what became of the child i do not know but when three hours later the troops cleared the square in front of the cafe the dead and wounded amounted to between two hundred and fifty and three hundred and the china tables and interior decorations of the cafe were strewn down the avenue de l'opera as far as the rue de l'echelle and along the boulevard to the madeleine the opera house itself was not appreciably damaged although i am told that pieces of steak and chops and canned peas have since been found clinging to the third-story windows of its splendid façade my next effort was even more cautious i bought a plain sheet of note-paper and addressed it anonymously to the editor of la patrie asking for the desired information the next morning la patrie announced that if i would send my name and address to its office the communication would be answered suitably my caution was still great however and the name and address i gave were those of a blanchisseuse who ran a pretty little shop on rue rivoli that night the poor woman was exiled from france and the block in which she transacted business demolished by a mob of ten thousand i was about to give up when chance favoured me the next evening while seated in my box at the opera the door was suddenly opened and a heavy but rather handsome-eyed brunette of i should say fifty years of age burst in upon me mon dieu she cried as i turned save me tell them i am your chaperon your mother your sister anything only save me you will never regret it she had hardly uttered these words when a sharp rap came upon the door entrez i cried que voulez-vous messieurs i added with some asperity as five hussars entered their swords clanking ominously your name said one who appeared to be their leader anne warrington witherup if you refer to me said i drawing myself up proudly if you refer to this lady i added she is mrs watkins wilbur witherup my uh, my stepmother we are americans and i am a lady journalist fortunately my remarks were made in french and my french was of a kind which was convincing proof that i came from westchester county a great change came over the intruders pardon mademoiselle said the leader with an apologetic bow to myself we have made the grand faux pas we have entered the wrong box and may i know the cause of your unwarranted intrusion i demanded without referring the question to the state department at home we sought we sought an enemy to france mademoiselle said they we thought he entered here i harbour only the friends of france said i vive la withrope cried the hussars taking the observation as a compliment then chucking me under the chin and again apologizing with a sweeping bow to my newly acquired stepmother they withdrew well mamma said i turning to the lady at my side perhaps you can shed some light on this mystery who are you softly if you value your life came the answer zola c'est moi mon dieu said i vous bien 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 speak in english she whispered then i can understand oh i only said well 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 i explained and you have adopted this disguise because i have resolved to live long enough to get into the academy he explained 
i cannot tell you how grateful i am for your timely aid if they had caught me they would have thrown me down into the midst of the clack come said i rising and taking him by the hand i have come to paris to see you at home it was my only purpose i will escort you thither no no he cried never again i am much more at home here my dear lady much more pray sit down why when i left home by a subterranean passage perhaps you are not aware over a thousand members of the national guard were singing the marseillaise on the front piazza three thousand were dancing that shocking dance the can can in my back yard and four regiments of volunteers were licking for something to eat in the kitchen assisted by one hundred and fifty petroleurs to do their cooking all my bedroom furniture was thrown out of the second-story windows and the manuscripts of my new novel were being cut up into souvenirs poor old mamma said i taking him by the hand you can always find comfort in the thought that you have done a noble action it was a pretty good scheme replied zola a million pounds sterling paid to your best advertising mediums couldn't have brought in a quarter of the same amount of fame or notoriety and then you see it places me on a par with hugo who is exiled that's really what i wanted miss witherip hugo was a poseur however and if he hadn't had the kick to be born before me ah said i interrupting for i have rather liked hugo and where do you wish to go to america he replied dramatically to america it is the only country in the world where realism is not artificial you are a simple unaffected outspoken people who can hate without hating can love without marrying can fight without fighting i love you sir or rather mamma said i somewhat indignantly for as a married man zola had no right to make a declaration like that even if he is a frenchman not you as you he hastened to say but you as an american i love ah who is your best publisher miss witherup i shall not tell you what i told zola but they may get his next book monsieur zola said i placing great emphasis on the monsieur tell me what interested you in dreyfus humanity or literature both he replied they are the same literature that is not humanity is not literature humanity that does not provide literary people with opportunity is not broad humanity but special and selfish and therefore is not humanity at all did dreyfus write to you i asked no said he nor i to him i have no time to write letters then how did it all come about i demanded he was attracting too much attention cried the novelist passionately he was living tragedy while i was only writing it people said his story was greater than any i emile wither up said i anxiously for it seemed to me that the people in the next box were listening merci said he yes i mrs watkins wilbur witherup of westchester city u s a was told that this man's story was greater and deeper in its tragic significance than any i could conceive wherefore i wrote to the war department and accused it of concealing the truth from france in the mere interests of policy of diplomacy i made them tremble i made the army shiver i have struck a blow at the republic from which it will not soon recover and to-day dreyfus pales beside the significance of zola i believe in free institutions but heaven help a free institution when it clashes with a paying corporation like a meal with her up do be cautious i put in again yet sir i added they have quashed your sentence and you need not go to jail no said he gloomily i need not why because jail is safer than home that is why they did it they dare not exile me they hope by quashing me to be rid of me but they will see i will force them to imprison me yet if you're so anxious to visit america why don't you i suggested 
there is no duty on the kind of thing we do not wish to manufacture ourselves ah said he if i was exiled they would send me if i go as a private citizen well i pay my own way oh said i i see and then as the opera was over we departed zola saw me to my carriage and just as i entered it he said excuse me miss witherup but what paper do you write for i told him it is a splendid journal he cried i take it every day and especially enjoy its sunday edition in fact it is the only american newspaper i read tell your editor this and here is my photograph and my autograph and a page of my manuscript for reproduction he took all of these things out of his basque as he spoke i will send you to-morrow he added an original sketch in black and white of my house with the receipt of my favourite dish together with a recommendation of a nerve tonic that i use with this will go a complete set of my works with a few press notices of the same and the prices they bring on all bookstands good-bye god bless you he concluded huskily i shall miss my stepdaughter as i would an only son adieu we parted and i returned much affected to my rooms while he went back i presume to his mob-ridden home end of chapter six chapter seven of peeps at people being certain papers from the writings of anne warrington witherup by john kendrick banks this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S. K. Edison, New Jersey. Peeps at People, Chapter Seven, Sir Henry Irving. The impression left upon my mind by my curious and intensely dramatic encounter with Zola was of so theatric a nature that I resolved to get back to conventional ground once more through the medium of the stage. I was keyed up to a high pitch of nervous excitement by my unexpected meeting with an unsuspected stepmother, and the easiest return to my norm of equanimity, it seemed to me, lay through the doors of the green room. Hence I sought out London's only actor, Sir Henry Irving. I found him a most agreeable gentleman. He received me cordially on the stage of his famous theatre. There was no setting of any kind all about us were the bare cold walls of the empty stage and it was difficult to believe that this very same spot the night before had been the scene of brilliant revels how do you do miss mitherup said sir henry as i arrived advancing with this peculiar stride which reminds me of dear old dobbin on my father's farm it is a great pleasure to welcome to england so fair a representative of so fine a press i wish to see you at home sir henry I replied, not deciding to let him see how completely his cordiality had won me, and so affecting a coldness I was far from feeling. "'That is why I have you here, ma'am,' he said. "'The stage is my home. The boats for me, the flare of the limelights, the pit, the sweet family circle, the auditorium in the dim distance, the footlights. Ah, these are the inspiring influences of my life. The old song, Home is where the heart is, must in my case be revised to favour the box office and instead of the old oaken bucket the song i sing is the song of the old trap-door did you ever hear the beautiful poem the song of the old trap-door no sir henry i never did said i i hope to however i'll do it now for you he said and assisting me over the footlights into a box he took the centre of the stage ordered the calcium turned upon him and began how dear to my heart are the scenes of my triumphs in hamlet othello and shylock as well completely confounding the critics who cry hums and casting over others a magic spell how dear to my soul are the fond recollections of thunderous clappings and stampings and roars as bowing and scraping in many directions i sink out of sight through the old trap doors the old trap doors the bold trap doors the creaking and squeaking sink down through the floors. I could not restrain my enthusiasm when he had finished. 
bravo i cried clapping my hands together until my palms ached more there is no more said sir henry with a gratified smile you see recited before ten or twenty thousand people with the same verb that i put into eugene aram or ten little nigger boys so much enthusiasm is aroused that i cannot go on the applause never stops so of course a second verse would be a mere waste of material quite so i observed then a thought came to me which i resolved to turn to my profit sir henry i said i'll bet a box of cigars against a box for your performance tonight that i can guess who wrote that poem for you in one guess done he replied eagerly austin said i make miss witherup out a ticket for box a for the merchant of venice tonight cried the famous actor to his secretary how the deuce did you know oh that was easy i replied much gratified at having won my wager i don't believe any one else could have thought of a rhyme to triumphs like cry homs you have a wonderful insight remarked sir henry but come miss witherup i did not mean to receive you in a box or on a bare stage what is your favorite style of interior decoration his question puzzled me i did not know but that possibly sir henry's words were a delicate method of suggesting luncheon and then it occurred to me that this could not possibly be so at that hour one o'clock actors never eat at hours which seem regular to others i hazarded an answer however and all was made clear at once i have a leaning towards the empire style said i sir henry turned immediately and rode upward into the drops hi billy said the third act of sans jean and tell my valet to get out my bonapartes the lady has a leaning towards the empire excuse me for one moment miss witherup he added turning to me if you'll remain where you are until i have the room ready for you i'll join you there in five minutes the curtain was immediately lowered and i sat quietly in the box as requested wondering greatly what was going to happen five minutes later the curtain rose again and there where all had been bare and cheerless i saw the brilliantly lit room wherein bonaparte as emperor has his interview with his ex-laundress it was cosy comfortable and perfect in every detail and while i was admiring who should appear at the rare entrance but bonaparte himself or rather sir henry made up as bonaparte dear me sir henry i cried delightedly you do me too much honour that were impossible he replied gallantly still lest you be embarrassed by such preparations to receive you let me say that this is my invariable custom and when i know in advance of the tastes of my callers all is ready when they arrive unfortunately i have had to keep you waiting because i did not know your tastes do you mean to say that you adapt your scenery and personal makeup to the likings of the individual who calls i cried amazed always said he it is easy and i think courteous for instance when the archbishop of canterbury calls upon me i have canterbury cathedral set here and wear vestments and receive him in truly ecclesiastical style the organ is kept going and lines of choir boys suitably garbed pass constantly in and out when the king of denmark called i had the throne room scene of hamlet set and we talked with his majesty sitting on the throne and myself clad as a melancholy prince reclining on a rug before him he expressed himself as being vastly entertained it gave him pleasure and was no trouble to me beyond giving orders to the stage manager then when an old boyhood friend of mine who had gone wrong came to see me hearing that he was an inebriate as well as a thief i received him in the character of dubos in the attic scene of the lion's mail a very interesting plan said i and one which i should think would be much appreciated by all true replied sir henry and then he laughed it never failed but once said he and then it wasn't my fault old beerbaum tree came to visit me one morning and i had the graveyard scene of hamlet set and myself appeared as a crushed tragedian i thought tree had some sense of humor and could appreciate the joke but i was mistaken he got as mad as a hatter and started away in a rage if he hadn't fallen into the grave on the way out i'd never have had a chance to explain that i didn't mean anything by it by this time i had clambered back to the stage again and was about to sit down on one of the very handsome empire sofas in the room when sir henry gave a leap of at least two feet in the air and roared with rage send the property man here he cried trembling all over and turning white in the face 
Send him here. Bring him in chains. If he is upstairs, throw him down. If he is downstairs, put him in a catapult and throw him up. It matters not how he comes, as long as he comes. I shrank back in terror. The man's rage seemed almost ungovernable, and I observed that he held a poker in his hand. Up and down the room he strode, muttering imprecations upon the property man, until I felt that if I did not wish to see murder done, I would better withdraw. "'Excuse me, Sir Henry,' said I, rising and speaking timidly. "'I think perhaps I'd better go.' "'Sit down,' he retorted imperiously, pointing at the sofa with the poker. I sat down, and just then the property man arrived. "'Want me, Sir Henry?' he said. Irving gazed at him with a terrible frown wrinkling his forehead for a full minute, during which it seemed to me that the whole building trembled, and I could almost hear the seats in the top gallery creak with nervousness. "'Want you?' he retorted witheringly. "'Yes, I want you. As a nusher, perhaps. As a flunky to announce that a carriage waits. As a Roman citizen to say hi hi. But as a property man, never.' There was another ominous pause and I could see that the sarcasm of the master sank deeply into the soul of the hireling. Wha "'What have I done, Sir Henry?' asked the trembling property man. "'What have you done?' roared Sir Henry. "'Look upon that poker and see!' The man looked and sank, sobbing to the floor. "'Heaven help me,' he moaned. "'I have a sick grandfather, Sir Henry,' he added. "'I was up with him all night.' The great man immediately became all tenderness. Throwing the poker to one side, he sprang to where his unfortunate property man lay, and raised him up. "'Why the devil didn't you say so?' he said sympathetically. "'I didn't know it, Henderson, my dear old boy. Never mind the poker. Let it go. I forgive you that. Here, take this twenty-pound note, and don't come back until your grandfather is well again.' It was a beautiful scene, and so pathetic that I almost wept. The property man rose to his feet and putting the twenty-pound note in his pocket, walked dejectedly away. Sir Henry turned to me, and said, his voice husky with emotion, "'Pardon me, Miss Witherup. I was provoked.' "'It was a magnificent scene, Sir Henry,' said I. "'But what was the matter with the poker? I thought it rather a good one.' "'It is,' said he, sitting down in a small chair and twiddling his thumbs. "'But you see, this is an empire scene, and that confounded thing is a Marie Antoinette poker.' Why, if that had happened at a public performance, I should have been ruined. Might not Bonaparte have used a Marie Antoinette poker? I asked to draw him out. Bonaparte, Miss Witherup, he answered, might have done anything but that. You see, by the time he became emperor, every bit of household stuff in the palace had been stolen by the French mobs. Therefore it is fair to assume that the palace was entirely refurnished when Bonaparte came in, and as at that time there was no craze for Louis Quinze, or Louis Cise, or Louis Number this, that, and the other, it is not at all probable that Napoleon would have taken the trouble to snoop around the second-hand shops for a poker of that kind. Indeed, it is more than probable that everything he had in the palace was absolutely new. What a wonderful mind you must have, Sir Henry, to think of these things! I said enthusiastically. Miss Witherup, said the actor knight impressively, this is an age of wonderful minds, and there are so many of them that he who wishes to rise above his fellows must be careful of every detail. Would I have been a knight today had it not been for my care of details? Never. It would have gone to Willie Adun, or to my friend Tree, or to some other actor of the same grade. My principle, Miss Witherup, is not original. I look after the details, and the results take care of themselves. It is an old proverb of the pennies and the pounds all over again. It is wisdom, I said, oracularly, but it must be wearing. Oh, no, said Sir Henry, with a gesture of self-deprecation. There are so many details that I've had to make up a staff of advisers. As a matter of fact, I'm not a man. I'm a combination of men. In the popular mind, I embody the wisdom, the taste, the culture, the learning of many. In fact, Miss Witherup, while I am not London, London finds artistic expression in me. And you are coming to America again? I asked, rising, for I felt I ought to go. I was so awed by the humble confession of my host. Some day, said he, when times are better. Why, Sir Henry, I cried, you who have just given twenty pounds to your property man can surely afford to cross. 
I referred, madam, he interrupted, to times in America, for I contemplate charging five dollars a stall when next I visit you. You see, my next visit will be the first of a series of twenty farewell seasons which I propose to make in the States, which I love dearly. Don't forget that, please, which I love dearly. I want your people to know. I shall not, Sir Henry, said I, holding out my hand. Goodbye. Say au revoir, he replied. I shall surely see you at tonight's performance. And so we parted. On the way down the strand, back to my rooms, I met the property man who was evidently waiting for me. "'Excuse me, miss,' said he, "'but you saw?' "'Saw what?' said I. "'How he called me down about the Mary Antoinette poker?' he replied nervously. "'Yes,' said I, "'I did. "'Well, it was all arranged beforehand, miss, "'so that you would be impressed by his love for and careful attention to details. "'That's all,' said he. We other fellows at the Lyceum has some pride, miss, and we want you to understand that Sir Henry isn't the only genius on the programme by good long odds. It's not knowing that that made Her Majesty the Queen make her mistake. I don't know, Mr. Henderson, that Her Majesty had made a mistake, said I coldly. Well, she did, miss. She knighted Sir Henry as an individual when she ought to have knighted the whole blooming theatre, those others than him, as does it, he observed proudly. King somebody knighted a piece of steak. Why couldn't the Queen knight the theatre? Which struck me as an idea of some force, although I'm a great admirer of a man who, like Sir Henry, can dominate an institution of such manifest excellence. End of chapter 7、Chapter eight of Peeps at People being certain papers from the writings of Anne Warrington Witherup by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. Peeps at People, Chapter 8. Ian McLaren. So pleased was I with my experience at the Lyceum Theatre that, Fearing to offset the effects upon my nerves of Sir Henry Irving's wonderful cordiality, I made no more visits to the homes of celebrities for two weeks, unless a short call on Li Hung Chang can be considered such. Mr. Chang was so dispirited over the loss of his yellow jacket in the partition of the Chinese Empire that I could not get a word out of him except that he was not feeling really well, and that is hardly sufficient to base an interview on for a practically inexperienced lady journalist like myself. I therefore returned to English Fields again for my next interview, and having heard that the Reverend Ian McLaren was engaged on a translation into English of his Scottish stories, I took train to Liverpool, first having wired the famous object of my visit of my intention. He replied instantly by telegraph that he was too busy to receive me, but I started along just the same. There is nothing in the world that so upsets me as having one of my plans go awry, and I certainly do not intend to have my equanimity disturbed for the insufficient reason that somebody else is too busy. So I wired back to Liverpool as follows. Very sorry, but did not receive your telegram until too late to change my plans. My trunks were all packed, and my Scotch lassie costume finished. Expect me on the 1167. Will not stay more than a week. Signed, Anne Warrington Witherup. Dr. McLaren, being a courteous man, and I being a lady, I felt confident that this would fetch him, and it apparently did, for two hours later I received this message. Witherup, London. Am not here. Have gone to Edinburgh. Do not know when I shall return. Signed, McLaren. To this I immediately replied, McLaren, Liverpool. All right, we'll meet you at Edinburgh, as requested. Signed, Witherup. The reader will observe that it takes a smart British author to escape from an American lady journalist once she has set her heart on interviewing him. But I did not go to Edinburgh. I am young, and have not celebrated my thirtieth birthday more than five times, but I am not a gudgeon, so I refused to be caught by the Edinburgh subterfuge, and stuck to my original proposition of going to Liverpool on the 1167. And, what is more, I wore my Highland costume, and all the way down studied a Scotch glossary, until I knew the difference between such words as dower and hoots, as well as if I had been born and bred at Loch Mglasky. As I had expected, Dr. McLaren was there, anxiously awaiting developments. 
and as I stepped out of my carriage, he jumped from behind a huge trunk by which he thought he was concealed, and fled through the northwestern hotel out onto the street, and thence off in the direction of the Alexandra docks. I followed in hot pursuit, and, by the aid of a handy hansom, was not long in overtaking the unwilling author. It may be said by some that I was rather too persistent, and, knowing that the good doctor did not wish to be interviewed, should have relinquished my quest. It was just that quality in Dr. McLaren's makeup that made me persist. There are so few successful authors who may be said to possess the virtue of modesty in the presence of an interviewer that I determined to catch one who was, indeed, the only one of that rare class I had ever met. Dr. McLaren, I cried, as I leaped out of the hansom and landed, fortunately, on my feet. A lady journalist is a good deal of a feline in certain respects. Directly in his path? The same, he replied pantingly. And you are Miss Witherup? The very same, I retorted coldly. I am perfectly delighted to see you he said, removing his hat and mopping his brow, which the unwanted exercise he was taking had caused a drip profusely. Perfectly charmed, Miss Witherup. I eyed him narrowly. One wouldn't have thought so, I said, with a suspicious emphasis, from the way you were running away from me. Running away, my dear Miss Witherup? he gasped, with an admirable affectation of innocence. Why, not at all. Then why, Dr. McLaurin, I asked, were you running towards the docks within ten seconds of the arrival of my train? To the gentleman's credit, be it said that he never hesitated for a moment. Why, he cried, in the manner of one cut to the heart by an unjust suspicion, why? Because, madam, when you got out of that railway carriage, I did not see you, and fearing that I had mistaken your message, and that instead of coming from London by rail, you were coming from America by steamer, I hastened off down towards the docks in the hope of welcoming you to England and helping you through the custom house. You wronged me, madam, by thinking otherwise. The gentleman's tact was so overwhelmingly fine that I forgave him his fiction, which was not quite convincing, and took him by the hand. And now, said I, may I see you at home? A gloomy cloud settled over the doctor's fine features. That is my embarrassment, he said with a deep sigh. I haven't any. What? I cried. I have been evicted, he said sadly. You? For non-payment of rent? I asked, astonished. Not at all, said the doctor, taking a five-pound note from his pocket and throwing it into the street. I have more money than I know what to do with. For heresy. My house belongs to a man who does not like the doctrines of my books, and he put us out last Monday. That is why I understand, I said, pressing his hand sympathetically. I am so sorry. But cheer up, doctor, I added. I have been sent here by an American newspaper that never does anything by halves. I have been told to interview you at home. It must be done. My paper spares no expense. Therefore, when I find you without a home to be interviewed in, I am authorized to provide you with one. Come, let us go and purchase a furnished house somewhere. He looked at me astonished. Well, he gasped at length. I've seen something of American enterprise, but this beats everything. I suppose we can get a furnished house for $10,000, I said. You can rent all of Liverpool for that, he said. Suppose, instead of going to that expense, we run over to the golf links. I'm very much at home there, though I don't play much of a game. Its atmosphere is very Scottish, said I. It is indeed, he replied. Indeed, it's too Scotch for me. I can hold my own with the great bulk of Scotch dialect, with ease, but when it comes to golf terms, I'm a duffer from Dumfries. There are words like foozle and tee off and schlaff and baffy iron and glenlivet. I've had them explained to me many a time and oft, but they go out of one ear just as fast as they go in at the other. That's one reason why I've never written a golf story. The game ought to appeal strongly to me for two reasons. The self-restraint it opposes upon one's vocabulary of profane terms, and the large body of clerical persons who have found it adapted to their requirements. But the idiom of it floors me, and after several ineffectual efforts to master the mysteries of its glossary, I gave it up. I can drive like a professional, and my putting is a dream, but I can't converse intelligently about it, and as I have discovered that half the pleasure of the game lies in talking of it afterwards, I have given it up. By this time we had reached the railway station again, and a great light, as of an inspiration, lit up the doctor's features. Splendid idea, he cried. Let us go into the waiting room of the station, Miss Witherup. You can interview me there. 
I have just remembered that when I was lecturing in America, the greater part of my time was passed waiting in railway stations for trains that varied in lateness between two and eight hours, and I got to feel quite at home in them. I doubt not that in a few moments I shall feel at home in this one, and then, you know, you need not bother about your train back to London, for it leaves from this very spot in twenty minutes. He looked at me anxiously, but he need not have. When I discovered that he had not mastered the art of golfing sufficiently to be able to talk about it, at least, he suddenly lost all interest to me. I've known so many persons who were actually only half-baked, who could talk intelligently about golf, whether they played well or not. The tea-table golfers, we call them at my home near Weehawken, that it seemed to be nothing short of sheer imbecility for a person to confess to an absolute inability to brag about driving like a professional and putting like a dream. Very well, doctor, said I. This will do me quite well. I'm tired and willing to go back anyhow. Don't bother to wait for my departure. Oh, indeed, he cried, his face suffusing with pleasure. I shall be delighted to stay. Nothing would so charm me as to see you safely off. I suppose it was well meant, but I couldn't compliment him on his putting. Are you coming to America again? I asked. I hope to some day, he replied, but not to read or to lecture. I am coming to see something of your country. I wish to write some recollections of it, and just now my recollections are confused. I know, of course, that New York City is the heart of the Orange District of Florida, and that Albany is the capital of Saratoga. I am aware that Niagara Falls is at the junction of the Hudson and the Missouri, and that the Great Lakes are in the Adirondacks, and are well stocked with shad, trout, and terrapin. But of your people I know nothing save that they gather in large audiences and pay large sums for the pleasure of seeing how an author endures reading his own stuff. I know that you all dine publicly always, and that your men live in clubs while your ladies are off bicycling and voting, but what becomes of the babies I don't know, and I don't wish to be told. I leave them to the consideration of my friend Kane. When I write my book, Scooting Through the Shaharis, or Long Pulls on a Pullman, I wish it to be the result of personal observation, and not of hearsay. A very good idea, said I, and will this be published over your own name? No, madam, he replied. That is where we British authors who write about America make a mistake. We ruin ourselves if we tell the truth. My book will ostensibly be the work of Sandy Scootmon. Good name, said I, and a good rhyme as well. To what? he asked. Hootmon, said I, with a certain dryness of manner. Just then the train bell rang, and the London Express was ready. Here, doctor, said I, handing him the usual check as I rose to depart. Here's a draft on London for five thousand dollars. Our thanks to go with it for your courtesy. He looked annoyed. I told you I didn't wish any money, said he, with some asperity. I have more American fifty-cent dollars now than I can get rid of. They annoy me. And he tore the check up. We then parted, and the train drew out of the station. Opposite me in the carriage was a young woman who I thought might be interested in knowing with whom I had been talking. Do you know who that was? I asked. Very well indeed, she replied. Ian McLaren, I said. Not a bit of it, said she. That's one of our head detectives. We know him well in Liverpool. Dr. McLaren employs him to stave off American interviewers. I stared at the woman aghast. I don't believe it, I said. If he'd been a detective, he wouldn't have torn up my check. Quite so, retorted the young woman, and there the conversation stopped. I wonder if she was right. If I thought she was, I'd devote the rest of my life to seeing Ian McLaren at home. But I can't help feeling that she was wrong. The man was so entirely courteous, after I finally cornered him, that I don't see how it could have been anyone else than the one I sought. For, however much one may object to this popular author's dialect, England has sent us nothing finer in the way of courteous gentlemen than he. End of chapter 8、Chapter、nine of Peeps at People Being Certain Papers from the Writings of Anne Warrington Withrop by John Kendricks Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jenny Clements. Peeps at People, Ruyard Kipling. An endeavor to find Ruyard Kipling at home is very much like trying to discover the North Pole. Most people have an idea that there is a North Pole somewhere, but up to the hour of going to press, few have managed to locate it definitely. The same is true of Mr. Kipling's home. He has one, no doubt, somewhere, but exactly where that favored spot is is as yet undetermined. 
My first effort to find him was at his residence in Vermont, but upon my arrival I learned that he had fled from the Green Mountain State in order to escape from the autograph hunters who were continually lurking about his estate. Next I sought him at his lodgings in London, but the fog was so thick that if so be he was within, I could not find him. Then taking a piano steamer, I went out to Calcutta, and thence to Simla, and neither place was he to be found, and I sailed to Egypt, hired a camel, and upon this ship of the desert, cruised down the easterly coast of Africa to the Transvaal, where I was informed that, while he had been there recently, Mr. Kipling had returned to London. I immediately turned about, and upon my faithful and wobbly steed, took a short cut, catter-corner-wise, across to Algiers, where I was fortunate enough to intercept the steamer upon which the object of my quest was sailing back to Britain. He was travelling in cog as Mr. Peters, but I recognized him in a moment, not only by his vocabulary, but by his close resemblance to a woodcut I had once seen in the advertisement of a famous dermatologist, which I had been told was a better portrait of Kipling than of Dr. Skinbury himself, whose skill in making people look unlike themselves was celebrated by the publication of the woodcut in question. He was leaning gracefully over the starboard galley as I walked up the gangplank. I did not speak to him, however, until after the vessel had sailed. I am too old a hand at interviewing modest people to be precipitate, and knew that if I began to talk to Mr. Kipling about my mission, before we started, he would in all probability sneak ashore and wait over a steamer to escape me. Once started, he was doomed, unless he should choose to jump overboard. So I waited, and finally, as Gibraltar gradually sank below the horizon, I tackled him. Mr. Kipling, said I, as we met on the lanyard deck. Peters, said he, nervously, lighting a gin krisha. All the same, I retorted, taking out my notebook. I've come to interview you at home. Are you a good sailor? I'm good at whatever I try, said he. Therefore you can wager a spring bonnet against a co-hat that I am a good sailor. Excuse me for asking, said I. It was necessary to ascertain. My instructions are to interview you at home. If you are a good sailor, then you are at home on the sea, so we may begin. What work are you engaged on now? The hardest of my life, he replied. I am now trying to avoid an American lady journalist. I know you are an American by the Cuban flag you are wearing in your buttonhole. I know that you are a lady because you wear a bonnet, which a gentleman would not do if he could. And I know you are a journalist because you have confessed it. But for goodness sake, madam, address me as Peters, and I will talk on forever. If it were known on this boat that I am a Kipling, I should be compelled to write autographs for the balance of the voyage, and have come away for a rest. Very well, Mr. Peters, said I. I will respect your wishes. Why did you go to South Africa? After colour. I am writing a new book, and I needed colour. There are more coloured people in Africa than anywhere else. Wherefore? I see, said I. And did you get it? Hm, he sneered. Did I get it? It is evident, madam, that you have not closely studied the career of Rudyard. Er, uh, Peters. Did he ever fail to get anything he wanted? I don't know, I replied. That's what I wanted to find out. Well, you may draw your own conclusions, he retorted, when I speak that beautiful and expressive American word, knit. I put the word down for future use. It is always well for an American to make use of her own language, as far as is possible. And nowhere can one gain a better idea of what is distinctively American than from a study of English authors who use Americanisms with an apology, paid for, no doubt, at space rates. "'Have you been at work on the ocean?' I inquired. "'No,' said he. "'Why should I work on the ocean? I can't improve the ocean.' "'Excuse me,' said I. "'I didn't know that you were a purist.' "'I'm not,' said he. "'I'm a Peters.' There was a pause, and I began to suspect that, beneath his suave exterior, Mr. Kipling concealed a certain capacity for being disagreeable. I didn't know, said I, but that you had spent some of your time interviewing the boilers or the engines of the ship. A man who can make a locomotive over into an attractive conversationalist ought to be able to make a donkey engine, for instance, on shipboard, seem less like a noisy jackass than it is. Good, he cried, his face lighting up. There's an idea there. I'll write a poem on that donkey engine as a sort of companion to my McAndrew's hymn, and what is more, I will acknowledge my debt to you for suggesting the idea. I'm much obliged, Mr. Peters, said I coldly, but you needn't. You are welcome to the idea, but I prefer to make my own name for myself. If you put me in one of your books, I should become immortal, and while I wish to become immortal, I prefer to do it without outside assistance. 
Peters, nay, Kipling, immediately melted. "'If you were a man,' said he, "'I'd slap you on the back and call the steward to ask you what you'd have.' "'Thank you,' said I. "'Under the circumstances I am glad I am not a man. "'I do not wish to be slapped on the back, even by a British author. "'But if you really wish to repay me for my suggestion, "'drop your unnatural modesty and let me interview you frankly. "'Tell me what you think, if you ever do think. "'You've been so meteoric that one naturally credits you with more heart and spontaneity than thought and care. Very well, said he. Let the cross-examination begin. Do you ride a bicycle, I asked. Not at sea, he replied. What is your favorite wheel, I asked. The last that is sent me by the maker, he answered. Do you use any tonic, hair, health, or otherwise, which you particularly recommend to authors, I asked. I must refuse to answer that question until I have received the usual check, said Mr. Peters. "'Do you still hold with the Spanish that Americans are pigs "'and that New York is a trough?' I asked. "'There are exceptions, and when I last saw New York "'I was not a conscious witness of any particularly strong devotion to the pen,' "'he answered, uneasily and evasively. "'Do you like the American climate?' I asked. "'Is there such a thing?' he asked in return. "'If there is, I didn't see it. "'You Americans are on the experimental stage of existence, "'in weather as in government.' I don't think you have as yet settled upon any settled climate. My experience has been that during any week and any season of the year, you have a different climate for each day. I can say this, however, that your changes are such that the average is uncomfortable. It is hot one day, and cold the next, baking the third, wintry the fourth, humid the fifth, dry the sixth, and on the seventh you begin with sunshine before breakfast, follow it up with rain before luncheon, and a sleigh ride after dinner. It was evident that Mr. Peters had not lost his powers of observation. "'Why have you left Vermont, Mr. Kipling?' I asked. "'Peters!' he remonstrated in a beseeching whisper. "'Excuse me, Mr. Peters,' said I. "'Why have you left Vermont, Mr. Peters?' "'That is a delicate question, madam,' he replied. "'Are you not aware that my house is still in the market?' "'I am instructed,' said I, drawing out my checkbook, "'to get an answer to any question I may choose to ask at any cost.' If you fear to reply because it may prevent a sale of your house, I will buy the house at your own price. Forty thousand dollars, said he. It's worth twenty thousand, but in the hurry of my departure, I left fifty thousand dollars worth of notes stored away in the attic. I drew and handed him the check. Now that your house is sold, said I, why, Mr. Peters, did you leave Vermont? For several reasons, he replied, putting the check in his pocket and relighting his general Krisha, which had gone out. In the first place, it was some distance from town. I thought when I built the house that I could go to New York every morning and come back at night. My notion was correct, but I discovered afterwards that while I could go to New York by day and return by night, there was not more than five minutes between the trains I had to take to do it. Then there was a certain amount of human sympathy involved. The postman was fairly bent under the weight of the letters I received, asking for autographs. He came twice a day, and each time the poor chap had to carry a ton of requests for autographs. "'Still, you needn't have replied to them,' I said. "'Oh, I never tried to,' he said. "'It was the postman who aroused my sympathy. "'But you didn't give up trying to live in your own house "'that had cost you twenty thousand. "'For that?' I said. "'Well, no,' he answered. "'Frankly, I didn't. "'There were other drawbacks. "'You Americans are too fond of collecting things. "'For instance, I went to a reception one night in Boston, "'and I wore a new dress suit.' And by Jove, when I got home and took my coat off, I found that the tails had been cut off, I presume by souvenir hunters. Every mail brought countless requests for locks of my hair, and every week when my laundry came back there were at least a dozen things of one kind or another missing, which I afterwards learned had been stolen off the line by collectors of literary relics. Then the Kodak fiends that continually lurked about behind bushes and up in the trees and under the piazzas were a most infernal nuisance. I dare say there are fifty thousand unauthorized photographs of myself in existence today. Even these I might have endured, not to mention visitors who daily came to my home to tell me how much they had enjoyed my books. Ten or a dozen of these people are gratifying. But when you come down to breakfast and find a line stretching all the way from your front door to the railway station, and excursion trains coming in loaded to the full with others every hour, it ceases to be pleasant and interferes seriously with one's work. However, 
I never murmured until one day I observed a gang of carpenters at work on the other side of the street, putting up a curious-looking structure which resembled nothing I had ever seen before. When I had made inquiries, I learned that an enterprising circus manager had secured a lease of the place for the summer and was erecting a grandstand for people who came to catch a glimpse of me to sit on. It was then that the thread of my patience snapped. I don't mind writing autographs for eight hours every day. I don't mind being kodaked if it makes others happy. And if any Boston relicana finds comfort in possessing the tails of my dress coat, he is welcome to them. But I can't go being turned into a sideshow for the delectation of circus-loving people. So I got out. I was silent, for I knew precisely what he had suffered and could not blame him. I suppose, I said sympathetically, that this means you will never return? Oh, no, said he. I expect to go back some day. But not until public interest in my personal appearance has died out. Sometimes somebody will discover some new kind of a freak to interest you people. And when that happens, I will venture back for a day or two. But until then, I think I will stay over here. Where an illustrious personage can have a fit in the street if he wants to, without attracting any notice whatsoever. There are so many great people over here, like myself, and Lord Salisbury, and Emperor William, that fame doesn't distinguish a man at all. And it is possible to be happy, though illustrious, and to enjoy a certain degree of privacy. Just then the English coast hove in sight, and Mr. Kipling went below to pack up his mulligatawny, while I drew close to the rail and reflect upon certain peculiarities of my own people. They certainly do love a circus. End of chapter 9